Okay, it is 1031. Uh, people are still joining, but it's time to, to start. We are delighted as KPNG EMEA to welcome you all to this webinar. It is the first webinar which is organized by our network to present globally, at least at the EMEA region, the, um, the CBAM. And uh, we have uh, speakers uh, from different EU member states uh, that will take uh, the presentation of the different contents of the CBAM. CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, is a new, uh, a new driver of understanding the relation with the international transactions. It is a care to the environmental impact. And we will show you how this will change the approach to uh, import of some materials for all the EU importers uh, which are involved by the materials uh, concerned by the new regulation. Uh, the speakers today are from different member states. We will see um, first uh, uh, my fellow partner Ruth Guerra from France uh, starting the webinar, then Stefan Freismuth from Germany, Frederic Chappelle from Belgium, and Aurora Marocco from the Italian practice. Also, we are delighted to have as a host uh, Mr. Thomas Brinkman from the uh, DG Taxud, which will uh, uh, stay with us at the end of the webinar for understanding better what is the perspective of the CBAN and what we will have to expect from the European Commission, which will be the developments of any of these uh, new uh, requirements. So uh, I'm pleased to introduce you to Ruth Guerra. Ruth, uh, please take the floor and thank you very much for joining the, the webinar. We are uh, get started for, uh, for the CBAM uh, webinar. Please. Ruth. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for joining this, this webinar. Um, as you might know, international trade has a significant impact on climate change, but so far we had only a few regulations that were aiming to protect nature, like for example the city conventions, cities conventions, sorry about endangered species of fauna and flora. Uh, that had a real impact uh, from a customs point of view, from an export and importation formalities point of view. Since yesterday, with the, with the entering in force of the carbon border adjustment mechanism, we have in Europe uh, a new regulation that takes into account the CO2 content of a product uh, at the time of the importation. And CBAM is just one of the um, one of the examples that we will have in the coming years if you take also into account uh, the the new uh, regulation about uh, deforestation from a european point of view uh, the battery passport or the circularity uh, regulation in the coming years we are going to see that our work as customs expert and uh, and uh, and people engaged in customs and trade are going to evolve um to take into account more and more the, the, the trustability of the product and, and their <clears throat> their um, um, pollutant status and circularity at the time of the importation. So my my work today is just to give you a quick overview about uh, CBAM, uh, how it works and how it will evolve, and and after I will. Uh, give the floor to my, to my colleagues to explain a little bit more in detail what is the impact from an import point of view and from a customs point of view. So, sorry. So what is what is CBAM? As you know, the European Union has made the green transition one of their main priorities and has the goal to become climate neutral by 2050. Uh, to achieve this target, uh, a different type of regulation has been uh, amended or created, uh, notably in the FIFA 55 packages. And one of the major mechanisms to achieve this neutrality is the modification of the European trade system. What is the European trade system? It's um, a cap and trade mechanism. So it's a cap on the total of greenhouse gases that are emitted by operators covered by the system and the cap is reduced over time and the, the new regulation is going to reduce it higher so and there is also some free allowance that has been permitted so far that are going to be removed until 2036. 
moreover, we are going to have new type of sector that are going to be included in the ETS. And in order to be able to ensure that this uh, modification of the European trading system is not going to have a negative impact um, from a uh, from a uh, commercial point of view, a competitiveness point of view for European producer, and also to promote the carbonization of industries around the globe, um, the European Commission introduced the CBAM border adjust the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. <clears throat> which has an impact at the time of the importation. What is the aim of uh, CBAM? The aim is to be uh, like a mirror of ETS and to ensure that the carbon price that is going to pay to produce a good in Europe are going to be the same that is going to be supported by a, a product that is going to be imported in U Europe if it's got to produce abroad. Uh, there is, and you can see this in the, in the, in the little schema, the aim is really to compensate this difference of price. So it will evolve during the time, uh, during the time because we are going to have a decrease of these free allowance, uh, and also because new products are going to be introduced under the scope of CBA. Um, as I was saying, there are two aims, two main aims of this um, of this carbon border adjustment mechanism. One is to ensure that we uh, are able to avoid carbon leakage. That means that uh, producers uh, are going to are going to be delocalized, they uh, they're going to move abroad, uh, so to be uh, relocated uh, outside Europe in countries with a, a less uh, strict climate policies or carbon pricing. Uh, and the other one also is to ensure that uh, um, more pollutant products are no, not going to be uh, less expensive uh, at the time of the consumption in, in Europe. Um, moreover, uh, the aim is to push other countries outside Europe to uh, um, have or think on a carbon pricing, on a carbon uh, um, policy in order to promote uh, decarbonization on the industry. You just have here on, on the slide or one simple uh, um, map about what are the type of um, countries in which you have already some carbon policies around the globe, glo the globe, and in green you have the one that are already thinking also the possibility to introduce a local CBAM, like for example in Canada and in Australia or in the in the UK. So the aim is also to 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 promote uh, uh, CBAM around around the world. How is going to work? As we were saying, we will have different phases that will evolve over, over the time. The first phase is going to st started yesterday, sorry, and is going to go until um, uh, 1st of January 2026. Is that transitional phases um, to allow uh, importers and suppliers outside Europe to be prepared for all the reporting uh, from ITs that they need to perform. Uh, so far, it covers only six types of products, electricity, iron and steel, cement, fertilizer, aluminum and hydrogen. But over the time, it should cover all the products that are issued from one of the sectors that are covering, uh, covered under the European trading systems. As I was saying, to be compliant to the WTO rule, CBAM is always a mirror from a scope point of view, from a price point of view also. Um, so, after 2026, uh, after the transitional period in which we only have reporting obligation, uh, CBAN certificates are going to become payable uh, at the same price or an average uh, price of uh, similar to the one of uh, the ETS at the, at the moment of the importation. Uh, it will all, we will always have a compensation in order to ensure that um, uh, while we have free allocation under ETS, no CBAM price is going to pay at the time of the importation. As I was saying, to ensure that we, it is always a mirror from the, the, the carbon price from paid uh, for the same production in the European Union. And after 2026, there is no uh, free allocation anymore under ETS uh, system, so uh, there will be also a full scope uh, uh, of application of the, of the CBAM. What is going to be uh, the what is the impact from from a compliance point of view of of CBAM? 
Um, first of all, uh, impact at the time of the importation in, in Europe, um, uh, with quarterly reporting uh, for the transitional period and annual reporting on the on the definitive, definitive period. So that means that importer are going to are going to be uh, 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 sorry. That means that importer will need to uh, determine what are the type of products that they import that are under CBAM. Uh, collect the information from the supplier about the embedded emissions of this product and make the reporting uh, to the CBAM authorities uh, via the CBAM portal. Uh, there is also a big impact for, for CBAM outside Europe because the, the one that is going to need to determine and, and monitor and, and certify the embedded emissions of the product that are going to be imported in Europe are the suppliers uh, outside Europe, so the producer outside Europe. And this is one of the of the main impact that, uh, that that we need to take into account is the the need to inform your suppliers outside Europe about uh, the compliance obligation that you have and to collect all the information of the embedded emissions of the product on the way that you need to be able to report it. Um, here you have a timeline. I already explained to this, but uh, we have a transitional period. So from yesterday to uh, 1st of January 2026, in which we will only have uh, measurements of the emissions and quarterly reporting obligation without any payment of the CBAM certificate. And after 1st of January 2026, we have a definitive implementation, which means that importer records will need to have to be, uh, sorry, CBAM declarant, uh, uh, need to purchase CBAM certificate, uh, um, representative of 80% of the imported product, and will need to also to uh, declare to make annual reporting obligation. And in this period between 2026 and 2024, 2034, we'll have an evolution of uh, Product that are going on the scope of CBAM and also um, type of uh, emissions that are concerned. So, so this is what I just explained. And um, concerning the transitional period, we will go. My colleagues will be a little bit more in detail. But what is important to have in mind is that uh, we'll have a CBAM declaration quarterly reporting to make um, by quarter first. Uh, first one need to be submitted before the end of January 2026 and concern uh, the last quarter of 2023. Um, in this report, you will need to report notably uh, the quantity of import products by, by, by tariff cost, the country of origin, the installation where the good is produced, uh, and the direct and indirect emissions, and also the price, the carbon price paid in the production countries. Moreover, uh, in doing this transitional period, even if uh, it's a test for everybody, uh, there is some penalties that may be faced uh, in case the the the, the CMM report it is not uh, performed and is not performed correctly after uh, after receiving a, a request to to modify or to correct the data, which is which are between 10 and 50 percent by ton of uh, unreported embedded emissions. And last slide from my side, one of the main topic in which we we are uh, assisting client today is about what is the type of uh, calculation uh, of embedded emissions, how, could, how to determine it. So during the, the transitional phases, there are several methodology that are going to be allowed. Uh, if we take the first part of the transitional period until uh, July 2024, um, there is a European methodology, of course, that is going to be applied after the transitional period that is possible to be used uh, as, as reporting methodology, but uh, it's also possible to report any methodology that is applied, whether it's voluntary or compulsory by a regulation on the production countries. The aim of the first part of this transitional phases is really uh, to, um, to to push producers outside Europe to, to determine the embedded emissions, uh, to be able to provide to the importers uh, as much as inform information as they can, even if this information is going to be is going to be evolving over time. And just for you to have in mind that after the transitional 
sorry, after, before the end of the transitional phases, so 1st January 2025, all the, method, the only methodology that works will be the European one, whether it is uh, on the calculation basis or a mission based basement, sorry, but uh, um, that need to be um, uh, accredited by an accredited verifier. So uh, you will have also these uh, phases uh, in which you will need to um, give information to your supplier and be able to provide them with all the, the needs that you have to ensure that you are going to be compliant at the time of the of the reporting. Massimo, I know I saw you, <laughs> so I think my time is over. No, no, please. Uh, uh, no, no, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, so Ruth, thank you very much. It is uh, really very interesting because we understood that there is a, a new a uh, new requirement for the importers. This is not uh, uh, related to what we did traditionally at any import. So identifying what is the nature of the goods in order to mm. file the declaration and then pay a duty. It's something different. And now we are yeah. in the transitional period. Indeed. So Ruth, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I would then uh, give the floor to our colleagues uh, Stefan and, and Fred from uh, Germany and from Belgium, uh, because uh, we are in today in uh, the transitional period. There are some activities that must be done. And so uh, I would like uh, Stefan and Fred to take the floor and show what's going on, what, which are the materials involved and what we are expect to do for the next weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fabio, and thanks, Ruth, as well. So now we know a bit of the background, the big picture. Why do we have an EU CVM? What's what's the idea, the aim of an EU CVM? And that's now in the, 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 the next part, uh, Stefan and myself will guide you a bit. What does it mean eh, for importers? What does it mean for, for companies? Eh? Just going to the next slide. And this is a very important one. What's, what is now actually the scope uh, uh, of CVM? So the aim of CVM is to report and to tax on embedded CO2 to content of imported goods. So that's the aim what, what CBAM wants to do. And also, as Fabio uh, uh, told us, it's, it's something new. We, we, we don't have, especially from a customs point of view, uh, the, the history to really tax or to calculate the CO2 content. My colleague uh, Stefan will come back to that in very much detail, how to calculate CO2 content and what the, the, the issues and the hurdles can be on that as well. But before we, we before that, we need to see, okay, on which type of goods do we need to pay CBAM? So there are two important things we need to take in, in, into account. First of all, it's on importation of goods, eh? meaning CBAM will only be applicable of the goods that you bring from outside the European Union into the European Union. So if you buy goods on the European market, even intra-community from another EU member state, CBAM will not be directly applicable to you. It can, of course, be applicable to your EU uh, supplier who imports, but as a direct impact, it's on the importation of goods, so goods that you bring from outside Europe to one of the 27 uh, uh, member states. Also, what is importation? Importation, from a customs point of view, it's bringing into free circulation, meaning opening them up for the EU market. Eh? There are various customs suspensive regimes, and uh, uh, my colleague Aurora will come back to that later on as well, more in detail. There are uh, a lot of customs suspensive regimes, customs warehousing, inward processing, processing, temporary import, as long as your CBAM relevant material is under custom suspension, CBAM is not applicable. It's only when you bring it into free circulation and when you free it for the European market. So that's very important already for importers that you have a view on your customs regimes. Eh? Do we import everything on the free circulation? Do we have custom suspension regimes like warehousing, inward processing? That's already first to do eh, if you want to have a to-do list that I would uh, um, advise for importers to have a look at how does my customs landscape uh, looks today before uh, CBAM. So importation. The second part is indeed on products. Which kind of products? It's a limited list of products. So like Ruth said, CBAM is there to mirror the European ETS. Eh? So the, the, the products that are on the scope of ETS are some downstream products as well. So it will be an ever-expanding list. Eh? Um, and in the end, once it's fully up and running beyond 2030, it is uh, expected that it will cover more or less all the industrial goods. Uh, so it is an expensive list, 
but it's also an exhaustive list, a limited list. So in the, in, in the end, you, the regulation, the CBAM regulation has um, uh, listed all the products that are in scope. If your product that you import is on that list, you're, you're, you're liable for CBAM. If you import products that are not on that list, you're not liable for CBAM. Sometimes it's that black and white. Eh? So we see indeed there are six product families on that list, steel and iron, aluminum, hydrogen, fertilizers, electricity and, and, and cement. And for each of those products, there are um, a number of commodity codes uh, identified. So that's another very important step. Eh? Uh, when we do an importation, we have to uh, identify our product that we import by a commodity code. Eh? And that will also here be the trigger, next to a lot of other things from a customs point of view, would be the trigger to see if your imported goods falls under CBAM or, or not. Very black and white, do I import goods that fall into that restrictive list of, of commodity codes. Eh? So there as well, in order to prepare or to make sure that you do declare all the goods that you should declare also for from a CBAM perspective, you need to have a view on your commodity codes that you import. So that's a, a very important exercise that we see at companies as well, to have that visibility, because in an import process, very often companies do not report directly to the customs authorities themselves. Very often there's a customs agent, a broker uh, uh, in the middle that, that sits on a lot of data. So you will need to see as well what is now the best way for each of the legal entities uh, that I have that are importing goods. Eh? To have a list of all the commodity codes, the products that I have been importing for the last six months uh, uh, to a year. That can be internal data of your ERP system, that can be data of your customs agent, that can also be data of the authorities. In some European member states, the customs authorities provide uh, that data to the importers as well. But it's very important to have a look uh, at the data that you are at the imports that you have already made and the commodity codes that you are importing. What we also see in that commodity codes, it's a restrictive list, very black and white, like I already said, but they need to be correct, of course. And there we see with a lot of companies that because of the fact that uh, the customs uh, mechanism and, and, and the importation process has that customs agent uh, uh, there as well, and sometimes has been outsourced for a bit towards, for example, customs agents, that there's not always a lot of comfort on the correctness of commodity codes. Of course, your, your goods need to be uh, identified uh, uh, with the correct commodity code for importation. If, for example, you would import a good wrongfully classified, I think, okay, I'm not um, uh, liable for CBAM because I don't have an importation of a good that falls within that commodity code. But later on, there would be a control of the customs authority saying, hey, you attributed a wrong commodity code and you have to change it, it can go back three years as well, uh, you would, uh, of course, be in violation of CBAM as well. So make sure once you have visibility on the commodity codes, also that you have comfort that these commodity codes are, are correct. And that's also very important. And then the last thing that I want to say on the scope uh, uh, there as well, although there is a limited list of commodity codes uh, for the six families, what we see, and that's a very important one, at the last, um, uh, yeah, draft of, of the regulation, some commodity codes were added. And here, for example, if you look at steel and iron, eh, uh, the 73, 26, uh, don't, don't want to be too technical, but we see that also the residual codes have been added there. So even though you think like CBAM is mainly on primary products eh, uh, and, and I import things that are really worked at, eh, so I don't fall under CBAM, that can be uh, uh, incorrect because a lot of times, very often, we see that, that, that products are classified in the residual codes, other articles of iron and steel, other articles of, of aluminum, eh? and these also fall in scope of CBAM. So really, that's an important exercise. Have a look at your customs uh, landscape. What do I import? Uh, where do I have the data? Uh, do I have comfort that my commodity codes are correct? And that's the first step you need to do to make an impact assessment for CBAM. So that's the scope. Very important slide. But no, it's not because you're not in scope today that you will not be in scope tomorrow. There will be an extension, like Ruth already said. And I think end of 2025, the Commission, European Commission, should also come with a report uh, on the next um, yeah, products to be uh, included in the scope. Are there any exemptions from CBAM? So certain products that would fall under scope but are exempt. I would say very little uh, when we see indeed the uh, a business setup. 
important to know there is no threshold for CBAM when it comes to value or weight or CO2 content. Yeah? Other, like for example, the plastic packaging tax, it is uh, as of the moment you bring a certain ton of plastic, non recycled plastic packaging onto the market. CBAM does not have that. It only has one value threshold, and that's for a single consignment under uh, 150 euros. But that's more on e commerce. So CBAM is in principle not applicable, or there's an exemption for uh, uh, e commerce. In most of the flows that we see uh, in businesses, this is not applicable. Um, there's also exemptions for goods and personal luggage. So if I, I don't know, cross a border with uh, uh, aluminum in my uh, personal luggage, I will not be uh, in scope of CBAM. Eh? Military uh, activities, um, also less important. But the fourth one is goods from exempted countries. So in the CBAM regulation, there's a, goods of, uh, a list sorry, of countries that are exempt because they are, yeah, uh, they have a very similar or the same system like the European uh, ATS, the emission trading system, where Ruth uh, uh, already referred to a couple of times. Eh? For the moment, these are the EFTA countries. So Switzerland, Norway, uh, Iceland, etc. So if you import goods uh, from these countries that are also exempt uh, uh, from CBAM, I think Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, these are the most uh, uh, important ones. So next to the commodity codes, and the custom status, it's also very important that you track the country of origin. It's not only where it's sent from, that's a country of dispatch, but it's really where the good is produced, country of non-preferential origin. So that's another customs uh, related topic that needs to be uh, under control. Do importers need an authorization? There as well, we make uh, the distinction between the transitional reporting phase as of today, yesterday, until the end of 2025. Uh, there, the reporting obligation lies on the importer of records. Eh? So the companies that do are mentioned on an import declaration as importer of records, and they do not need an authorization to uh, import CBAM goods in the reporting phase where it's only a statistical reporting. As of the actual final CBAM system at eh, 2026, um, CBAM goods, uh, for an importation of CBAM goods, uh, there will need to be an authorized CBAM declarant playing its role as well. So CBAM goods will need to be imported by an authorized CBAM declarant. That's a, a role that does not exist today. Typically today we have an importer of records, we have a customs agent under direct or indirect representation, but that's it. Eh? Um, there will be a new player in this international uh, uh, value chain, uh, authorized CBAM declarant. Eh? Uh, it's that authorized CBAM declarant that also will be responsible to have sufficient CBAM certificates at the moment of importation at the 80% that Ruth was already referring to and that we will uh, talk about later on as well. It's also that authorized CBAM declarant that will need to uh, file, not quarterly, but yearly CBAM declarations and then also submit the CBAM uh, certificates uh, at the end of May of each year. So there will be a new player in town, the authorized CBAM declarant, that does indeed need an authorization. Um, there are quite some conditions to have that authorization. We see uh, you need to be a good student, eh? uh, no outstanding debts, no serious or recurring infringements, uh, all these kind of things. These are also, by the way, the are a lot very similar um, criteria we see for the AEO, so the authorized economic operator, which is a kind of a, a quality certification from a customs point of view that is already uh, up and running since uh, I think 2008, something like that, um, for companies. We see that these are more or less the, the, the same criteria. There's not a direct link, but still it's a bit of the same criteria. So an authorized CBAM declarant needs to be a good student when it comes to customs and other uh, um, yeah, fiscal matters. Uh, very important as well, uh, he or she needs to be established in a European member state. So if you're not an established uh, entity, you cannot act as uh, authorized CBAM declarant uh, in the final system. That can, of course, be important for uh, um, Swiss uh, uh, companies, etc. So it's quite important that uh, that's taken into account. So between today and then, yeah, up to uh, 2025, yeah, it, it, it will need to be looked at uh, for each of the companies who will be that authorized CBAM declarant. Yeah? Will a group company do that for the uh, the group structure, so we'll make a kind of a center of excellence where we, where we group that and we will have one authorized C, uh, CBAM declarant on group entity level, 
or we will outsource that to customs agents. Will customs agents do it? Eh? What will be their conditions? Uh, that's all not clear today. So we know that the customs agents are not very uh, enthusiastic, let me call it like that, to take on that role as a CBAM declarant, but we need to see how this unfolds in the next uh, months uh, uh, to come. But that's quite important because if there is an importation of CBAM goods and there's no authorized CBAM declarant on that importation, there is a potential uh, uh, issue and the goods could be, I'm, I'm not saying they will be, but they could be blocked uh, at the EU border. Okay, what obligations do uh, importers have? I think after this slide, uh, we go more into detail on the calculation method of the CO2 content. Afterwards, there's some more detailed slide also on the obligations, both of importer of records and of the CBAM declarant. Just already uh, very shortly, an importer of records will have the obligation during the statistical transitional phase. So until the end of 2025, to yeah, gather all the information and to file report quarterly CBAM uh, uh, reports. That's the obligation of the importer of records very uh, uh, shortly. As of the final system, as of 2026, uh, uh, it will be the obligation of the authorized CBAM declarant uh, to file yearly CBAM declarations and to submit uh, uh, the CBAM certificates. And then we see as well to actually do quarterly um, uh, forecastings. Uh, uh, to make sure that each import uh, uh, is covered by uh, at least 80% of the necessary CBAM uh, certificates. But we'll come back to that uh, uh, later on. So I think now, uh, Stefan, uh, for the more technical part, if I can say on the CBAM calculation and the calculation of the COT content and what the possibilities are there. Yeah, thank you very much, Frederick. Um, yeah, let's focus on the final phase, on the emission trading phase, which starts as of uh, January 2026. And regarding the emissions calculation, at first, it's very important to understand it's not only a story on CO2 emissions. So also some other greenhouse gas emissions are have to be considered, have to be taken into account. And the whole system is set up based on actual values in general. There's only one exception. This is electricity. For electricity, as default, uh, the um, the default values uh, are applicable, and only uh, if it if the actual values can be justified and verified, uh, actual values for electricity can be used. Um, also important to know that uh, during the, tr the transition phase, during the reporting phase, um, the reporting focus on indirect and direct emissions. And not only as we have it here in the, uh, in the emission trading phase for some commodities uh, like for steel and aluminium products, uh, only that, that there is only the focus on uh, the direct emissions and not on the indirect emissions. But just I want to mention this, this is also under consideration if uh, we're thinking about the extension of the scope, it's not only ex extension or it will be not only as in extension based on products or common new additional commodities, there will be also an extension to um, the regarding the emissions emission scopes. Yeah. Of course, all actual uh, values on, on emissions have to uh, start in records so that, of course, uh, the verifiers can have access to the records and can do their verification. And that's also important to understand that in the final phase, uh, during the re uh, emission trading phase, uh, all information provided via CBAM declaration, including um, the uh, embedded emissions, uh, have to be verified by an accredited verifier. This is also different during the reporting phase. In the reporting phase, there's no requirement for this verification process, but in the final phase, as of uh, uh, 2026, uh, the verification of all provided information uh, is really required. Having a look into the details of the um, CO2 uh, or uh, greenhouse gas emissions calculation um, under CBAM, and this is important to understand, this is a completely new approach of doing calculations. Um, it's similar to the ETS calculation, but the difference is in the ETS and the emission trading system, the calculation of uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, is done based on installation level. Here in CBAM, we have... Uh, 
uh, the specific that uh, the calculation has to be done based on item level, on product level. So we need to know uh, which uh, emissions are embedded, which indirect and direct emissions are embedded in the individual product, which are uh, products which are uh, imported. Yeah, and so uh, this is the difference between ETS and also uh, the the CBAM approach. Also, to compare it to other um, calculation approaches, if you're talking about, for example, the product carbon footprint method or the uh, the environmental footprint standard, the PEF, the product environment footprint standard. So um, these standards have a much more wider scope of, of, of emissions, which is completely different um, to, to the CBAM calculations. For example, in the CBAM calculation, if we're talking about upstream and downstream uh, scope three emissions, which are generated during the transport of goods in the value chain, these emissions are not covered uh, under the CBAM approach. Uh, this is important to understand. So it, CBAM only focus on what emissions are generated during the production of the CBAM goods and uh, partially um, to, uh, it also covers emissions uh, embedded in materials and precursors uh, which are used for the production um, of, the, of the CBAM goods. That's important to, to, to understand. Regarding the concrete calculation, um, the regulation differentiates between simple goods and complex goods. And simple goods are defined uh, as follows. So it's only one, only one single production process for producing the goods. And um, the final good only contains zero emission materials and fuels. Yeah. So only uh, in minor cases, um, this uh, really simple formula for doing the calculation can be applied. So if we have a look to um, to complex goods, and these are what will be definitely the majority of goods which have to be considered. Um, so these are goods which are produced via several uh, subsequent processing steps, not only containing zero emission precursors and materials. And uh, in this calculation, of course, the quantity of direct and indirect emissions have to be uh, determined and in, in addition to this also the um, emissions embedded in the precursors used for the production of the shipping goods have to be uh, taken into account and uh, so the, the total amount of emissions have to be uh, divided through the quantity of pro uh, pro um, goods pro produced then you get uh, as result the uh, emissions uh, per ton of, of, of um, uh, tons of emissions per ton of, of final product. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the result in this formula. So clarifying some specific wordings, yeah, which are used or what, what or in other words, uh, which is, are essential to understand the difference uh, if you have to do the CO2 calculation or the CO2 calculation. So there's, the definition of direct emissions. So direct emissions are in general emissions which are generated uh, during the production process at all. Yeah? Uh, for example, for um, producing uh, um, heat or, or, uh, uh, or cold air, for example, for the production process, then the difference to direct attrib attributed emissions are exactly uh, the direct emissions, but um, uh, there, there's a breakdown to the concrete production process that you can say, okay, I have three different production lines and in production line A, B and C, uh, the, the direct emissions are, have this quantity. And this is the case if we're talking about direct attributed emissions. In addition to this, direct embedded emissions are the direct attributed emissions. But in, um, the difference is here that uh, also for the direct embedded emissions, are uh, the, you have to take into account, in, in addition, the uh, emissions embedded in materials and also precursors used for the production um, of the final CBAM goods. And finally, the specific direct embedded emissions, these are exactly the um, yeah, direct embedded emissions uh, with the breakdown 
to the specific uh, goods which are produced. And this is the result. So you get a um, ton of CO2 e emissions um, in relation to ton uh, goods produced. Yeah, Ruth already mentioned um, the different approaches or methods for doing CO2 e calculations. Of course, there will be only two standards or methods for doing the calculation um, in the European Union or under the CBAM regulation. It, at first, it will be uh, the calculation-based approach. So um, emissions have to be determined based on source streams uh, in addition to uh, yeah, specific uh, emission data, emission data based on, on, on standard values or uh, um, values which are really measured. Yeah, and um, so this will be, from my point of view, the most common approach for doing C2 calculation. But once again, this calculation based approach is not done on the based on, on, on guessing or doing Average uh, using average values, sector specific average values of, of CO two emissions. It has to really to be uh, to be done based on actual values. So, in other words, uh, if actual values not available and they won't be available for importers, uh, importers will have to reach out to the suppliers asking or requesting this information from uh, the exporters. Because um, yeah, this information can be only provided via a supply chain management process um, by the exporter or the manufacturer of the goods located outside of the European Union. The second approach or the second possibility for determining the CO2e emissions are the measurement approach. But uh, this is an approach uh, will be, from my point of view, only applicable uh, in, in a few um, uh, production processes um, because. Here you have directly to you have to, you have to directly measure uh, the, the generated greenhouse gas emissions in the um, in the flue gas or in the flue gas flow, uh, and you have to do continued measurement emission measurement based on on, on uh, the actual flue gas emissions. Yeah, and um, this only works also in, in simple production processes where you don't have to take into account materials. Uh, which are sub which you are getting supplied, uh, and which definitely also contain uh, embedded emissions. Then finally, of course, because we have some flexibility until the end of uh, 2024, um, so it's also will be uh, accepted that uh, the next year or until end of next year, other approaches are applied for determining the CO2 emissions. Uh, but there is the requirement that these alternative approaches like uh, monitoring, reporting and verification processes um, that they lead to similar to a similar coverage and accuracy of emission data like the other two um, uh, approaches I have already mentioned. Just one second, I have to jump to the next slide. So for the indirect emissions, the definitions are similar as we had um, for the direct emissions. The difference is here, indirect emissions are general emissions which are uh, emitted during the production of electricity. Yeah? And so if you're talking about indirect emissions, indirect attributed and indirect embedded and specific indirect embedded emissions, it's the same as we have discussed uh, for uh, the direct embedded emissions. Yeah? That's important. Um, to mention. Finally, the discussion on default values. That's important also to understand in which ways or in which situations I can use default values. So if you're only focusing on the final phase, when emission trading starts, um, the Commission will provide default values for electricity, but also um, for, um, for other goods. And um, these default values um, can be applied if uh, importers fail to get information from their suppliers. But these default values should only be used in a worst case scenario, yeah? because these default values will also have a markup. Yeah? So this will be really a worst case approach. So it's much more expensive, or it will be much more expensive 
um, to do the whole CBAM process based on these default values compared to doing this process based on uh, actual values. Yeah. And if we have a look into the reporting phase, yeah, during the reporting phase, um, it's also mentioned that default values can be used. But the default values cannot be used by the importers for final goods. The default values can only be used by the foreign installations, which have to determine the uh, embedded emissions, the quantity of embedded emissions. And uh, there is no limitation for the use of default values for precursors and materials until um, end of July next year. But afterwards, as of 1st August 2024, uh, there is a limitation uh, of 20%. So in other words, um, if default values are used for determining the embedded emissions for precursors and materials, um, then these emissions are not allowed to make more than 20% of the overall or the total emissions of the final, of the final goods. Yeah, that's, that's important to, to, to understand. So, and finally, what I mentioned, want to mention really clearly, um, it's really not um, advisable to use these default values. So the whole process should really be set up on, on actual values and only in the worst case approach. Uh, in the final phase, the default values should be used. And what I've mentioned in the reporting phase, uh, indirect and direct emissions have also to be determined based on actual values. There's only a, a small uh, possibility to use default values in the, in the cases I have already mentioned. Now I'm switching back to my colleague, to Frederick, uh, to mention some details about the operators in the foreign installations. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Stefan. So indeed, like uh, my colleague Stefan already said, EU importers authorize CVAM declarants. Uh, if, if, if you want to um, report on the correct uh, CO2 uh, uh, emission, it will be highly depending on your uh, non-EU uh, vendor, uh, your foreign uh, uh, supplier. So Ruth already mentioned it as well. Next to an impact on the EU importer side, uh, CVAM also has an impact on 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 uh, parties, on, on, on vendors, on, on exporters outside the European Union. Because also there, if you would want to report on actual emissions as an EU um, uh, CBAM authorized declarant, and you want to take into account the, the values that you are provided by your non-EU supplier, that non-EU supplier needs to register with the European Commission. Eh? Uh, so that's quite important. There is a registration needed from your non-EU supplier with the Commission. Um, to allow him or her to actually uh, give that um, actual data on the CO2 content um, of the products that, that they supply, that they export, and that then the EU uh, authorized CVAM declarant imports into the European uh, uh, Union. So uh, there's an obligation to register um, from a non-EU supplier perspective. Also then, of course, an obligation to determine the emissions according to uh, the, um, the criteria and the methods set by the EU Commission and also ensure that these are verified. So once it's fully up and running, uh, there's also a verification needed at the site of the non-EU uh, uh, supplier by a, an, an acknowledged verifier. Yeah? So quite some, some uh, um, yeah, importance on that non-EU supplier. So there as well, like, like uh, Stefan mentioned, it will be really key next to having an impact assessment on okay which products are now in scope which legal entities are in scope that we start mapping our non-EU suppliers from a CBAM perspective and reaching out to them as well to see if they are uh, capable of providing the necessary information if they are willing later on to get indeed uh, uh, registered with the uh, commission uh, registry uh, etc so that will be quite uh, key as well to do that supplier outreach that setup uh, 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 as well, and then of course also from the legal point of view to make sure that in the sourcing, in the procurement phase, uh, these things are taken into account and are legally uh, foreseen in the contracts. Uh, so that's quite quite important. The importance that we all will see there. What has to be considered with the CBAM certificate? So that's of course only as of 2026. Like I said, it will be the the authorized CBAM declarant that is. Um, that will need to file a yearly CBAM uh, declaration on the 31st of May of each year for all the imports uh, of the year before. And that's also the time 
that they will need to um, uh, ensure or, or that they will need to uh, submit the CBAM uh, uh, certificates. There will be a new um, registry that the Commission will set up to buy the CBAM certificates via the EU member states so that the authorized CBAM declarant can buy them, uh, uh, of course, on a daily basis, you can buy them. And the price of the, the EU CBAM certificates will be aligned of a price what one ton of CO2 would cost under the EU emission trading system. So there as well, that will be that mirror, as Ruth said as well, between the EU ETS and the EU CBAM, also from a pricing uh, uh, perspective. So it will be as, um, yeah, as, as, as uh, costly to actually produce a ton CO2 in the manufacturing in Europe as it would be to import a ton of CO2 embedded uh, uh, in the imported uh, uh, products. Just for your information, the price now for a ton CO2 in the ETS is a bit under 100 euros uh, per ton. It is expected that in the next years to come, that price will significantly go up eh? uh, because also, like we said in, in, in the introduction, the free allowances of the emission trading system will be phased out. That's a limited amount of, of emissions that are foreseen. Eh? Uh, so there, normally, we do expect a price uh, increase. There's no limited amount of CBAM certificates, but as they're mirrored with the price of the EUTS, also the price of a ton imported CO2 will go up. There, there are talks of around 200 uh, euros per ton. So it will be significant, uh, the price of a ton CO2 uh, to be imported. So end of May, authorized declarant need to make a declaration for the year before and to uh, submit all the CBAM um, certificates that were bought uh, uh, the year before. On the other hand, each quarter, there is something to do as well. Each quarter, um, you need to make, or the CBAM uh, authorized uh, declarant needs to make a forecast eh, um, of what he will uh, import of uh, CBAM relevant goods for the next quarter. And you will need to make sure that 80% of those Im imports are covered off by uh, CBAM, or CBAM certificates. Eh? So each quarter, you need to make that forecast and each quarter, you need to make sure that you have enough CBAM certificates uh, in your possession to make the imports. In order to make that uh, calculation, and that's a bit of a, a, a tricky part here as well, in order to make that calculation, um, you will need to use default values that Commission provides you. So for the, the, the quarterly forecasting, you will need to use default values, not actual values. Stefan already said these default values will be higher, eh, in, in most cases or in all the cases, higher than the actual values that of, of embedded CO2. But that's the value that you need to make to make your forecasting and to buy that 80% uh, uh, of your certificates. Of course, your CBAM declaration each year and the CBAM certificates that you used could be, eh, hopefully for you, eh, uh, based on actual values. Eh? So there could be a delta between the ones that you actually need eh, uh, based on actual values and the ones that you forecasted mandatory based on default values. What do you do with them if you have too, too many CBAM certificates? It's a bit different than the EU emission trading system where you can actually trade them between companies. A CBAM certificate will have a unique identification number and will be linked to a certain authorized declarant. So you cannot trade off CBAM uh, certificates with other companies. What you, do, what you can do is you can resell them to the Commission. Okay. So um, until the 30th of June, the European Commission can buy, at the price that you paid for them, can buy uh, uh, CBAM certificates if you have too many, if you have an excess of CBAM uh, uh, certificates. And that's a very uh, possibility because of the fact that you need to do your, 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 your forecasting on the higher default values. So if you would import very low, uh, import products with a very low CO2 content, so really green products, like green hydrogen, green steel, etc., and the delta between the default values of the commission and uh, uh, the products that you import, the actual values is so big, you could have uh, too many uh, CBAM certificates. You can resell them to the commission, but only up to a certain extent, only up to, I think, one third of uh, the ones that you bought. So there's a bit of an of an issue here that uh, really needs to be taken into account. With the ones that you cannot uh, sell back to the European Commission, they are cancelled as of the 30th of June, so you cannot uh, transfer them to the next year. Yeah, yeah. that's the last uh, slide from my side as well. 
but in case of non-compliance, so if you did not uh, uh, report uh, CBAM at all, or if you under-report CBAM, eh? so there are indeed uh, sanctions foreseen already as from the transitional statistical reporting period, there are sanctions foreseen between the 10 and 50 euros per under or under um, declared ton of CO2. Um, as of the final CBAM uh, system as of 2026, it's between 100 and 500 euro sanctions eh, per under declared or not declared ton of CO2. So quite significantly, significantly, do we think that they will already impose these penalties as of the first reporting period? Probably not. I think there will be a bit of, of leanway there as well. But know that even though eh, the first years it's a statistical reporting without financial consequences for companies, sanctions are foreseen. So there is uh, really an incentive for companies to take this seriously, even though the first years it's only statistical reporting. Eh? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Stefan as well. Um, we have not uh, so time, but there are some questions. And so I would raise one to you. Uh, there is a participant who is asking if uh, if the company is importing some raw material, I suppose, <clears> within <throat> the attachment one, and then process it to obtain end products to re-export all of them. Are these raw material within the CBAN as well, or they are exempted because the end product are exported away yeah. from you? Yeah. Um, but it can be both. <laughs> I know that's a very answer that you, you will get a lot from a consultant, but it can be both. If your raw material is in scope of CBAM, commodity code is in scope, and you put it into free circulation, it's in scope of CBAM. Then afterwards, if under free circulation, you do indeed uh, make it into a final product and you re-export it, the moment that it's in free circulation, CBAM is applicable. There are custom suspensive procedures foreseen, like inward processing, that are really tackling with these kind of situations of bringing in raw material into Europe, processing under suspension and re-exporting the final product. I think Aurora will, will come back to that as well. This gives you the benefit of, of saving on import duties already on your raw material, but also CBAM will be uh, suspended and not in scope if you export uh, your final product outside of Europe. If you would import the final product even under inward processing, CBAM would still be applicable at that time on your raw material. Eh? But there is, uh, right, to, 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 to make it a bit simple, there is a possibility to exempt these goods uh, uh, from CBAM if you use uh, the correct custom suspension regime, in this case, for example, inward processing. Fred, thank you very much. Very, very clear. So now it's time to leave the floor to Aurora from uh, the Italian practice who will uh, uh, who will introduce the customs uh, angles of uh, the CBAM. Thank you very much, Aurora. Uh, I leave you the floor. Thank you very much, Massimo. Thank you very much to all my colleagues. I'm now going to show you my presentation. So we have understood for everyone that the CBAM regulations applies to goods listed in Annex 1 originated in a third country where those goods or processed goods from those goods resulting from the inward processing are imported into the customs territory of the Union. So for each import, let me go to the next slide. Okay. So for each import, the import lodge a customs declaration as usual, and the customs authorities of the relevant EU member state perform the cross-check of the data declared in the customs declaration of importation. So, and which is the new from yesterday? The new is that now uh, the European Com Commission is able to cross-check with the customs authority of each member state through the CBAM transitory register to check if the data contained in the quarterly report are correctly mentioned uh, therein. So uh, customs authorities and the European Commission are able to identify, obviously, the EORI number, the CBAM account, the, nom uh, the combined nomenclature code, the origin of the goods, and also the quantity of the goods, but which is the main and the first issue that we have to understand under a customs perspective. Our first question is, I am a CBAM importer of goods relevant for such regime. Okay, let's 
try to understand who is deemed to be the importer of record in such a case, so who is the uh, person which needs to appoint as a reporting declarer for Sibon perspective. The importer should be deemed as the one who lodged a customs declaration for release for free circulation of goods on its own behalf and name. And what happens if we use a customs representative? Also, the indirect customs representative is able to become a reporting declarant where the customs declaration is lodged by this person for non-EU established operator or the indirect representative has agreed for, uh, to report uh, in the name of uh, another person. So these are the two main persons which could be deemed as reporting declarant. And which is the definition? What we mean for importation? We mean the release for free circulation. The release for free circulation as the aim, the purpose to fulfill all the customs formalities in order to access to the union market, likely uh, goods which has been realized and made in EU. So the release for free circulation confers to the non-EU goods the status of EU goods. This means that we have a release for free circulation which entails the payment of all the uh, customs duties and uh, the performing of all the customs formalities this, even the application of commercial policy, um, uh, policy measures as the CBAM is. So now we have to understand what happens when we uh, have the release to the market. We have to understand which is the data crucial to identify the release to the market. This is crucial in particular referring to the inward processing regime as my colleagues anticipated before me. Inward processing means that a um, good is important to you for processing with suspension of customs duties and VAT. And after the processing operation, the processed goods or the original imported goods can be exported or either imported into EU. So un, uh, uh, unless the goods are imported in EU, the goods are in a suspensive regime, so are bounded to the inward processing regime. What does this mean? This means that you don't have to pay customs duties, VAT, and even obviously you are not applying for CBAN rules. What happens if we are going to import the goods originally bounded to the inward processing regime or the finished progress, uh, products which are imported uh, once the um, uh, raw materials are, uh, um, are used to process the uh, finished products. We have to understand if we have uh, an importation, so a release for free circulation of goods originally bounded to the inward processing regime, since in this case, once again, it means that we are obliged to fulfill the CBAM uh, duties. In, the, in such a case, the reporting data are slightly different from the, um, from the form usually do in the simple cases of a release for free circulation, since we have to report what happened to the goods. So if we are going to release a good which has not been processed, or if we are importing a processed goods through the um, use of originally goods subject to the CBAM regime. So let's go to um, uh, recap which are, the, which are the current situation. Since from yesterday, we are in the transitional period. So the uh, reporting declarant is responsible just for reporting, not for paying anything. So this is the transitional period, uh, period which um, is going to be until 30 the 1st December of 2025, and this is a so-called learning phase, during which CBAM importers will report a set of data, including emission embedded in their goods, without paying any financial adjustment. So in such a case, we have just to 
uh, understand we we need to report who needs to report who is responsible for that the reporting declarant the reporting declarant which as we have understood is the importer who lodge a customs declaration for a lease for free circulation of goods in its own name and on its own behalf or the indirect customs representative where the customs declaration is lodged by this latter and when the importer is established outside the union or where the indirect customs representative has agreed to the reporting obligation. So, um, which are the data to be reported? We have understood that we have to report the total quantity of the goods, the type of the goods and the origin of the goods. Please, let's understand which is our main task. As Fred anticipated, we have to clear that the main task is to be aware of the commodity codes that we import during the um, during the court that we have to be, to report in our um, in our procedure. So the main task is to have a classification procedure, a classification process that let us to understand which are the goods that we are going to import, but also which are the correct combined nomenclature codes which are involved in the uh, importation procedure. So let's go to the next slide. Right, in the next uh, three, four minutes, may I ask you to then uh, resume for classification and origin what we need uh, uh, to take care of in this transitional period, what is the relevant points uh, for the yes. Ivan discipline? Yes, for sure. We are doing to explain it. So we have understood that for yesterday, we have six groups of certain goods that needs to be reported under the CBAM regime. So we have cement, iron, steel, aluminium, fertilizer, electricity, and hydrogen. Um, we have also uh, understood that some goods are excluded from this obligation. These are the goods of negligible value. Uh, but we have to um, clear that the first driver is obviously the classification that we'll see more in depth is linked to the tariff combined nomenclature and which is the uh, second the second driver beside the classification we need to know which is the country of origin of the goods so um, we, we um, are going to uh, show you some some few slides on the procedure to be applied to understand which is the correct classification of the goods and also which is the correct origin of the goods to be reported under the CBAM rules. Uh, just to recap, this is the, um, the uh, this is the list of the goods which are to um, included in the CBAM scope. We know that by uh, 2030, the scope of the CBAM is expected to expand also to other goods which are which are covered by the EU emission trading system, and this should be uh, include petroleum and petroleum goods. But as you may see from this list. Uh, the goods are um, identified by the combined nomenclature code. And in particular, um, as you see, we have uh, the goods identified with four, five, six, and eight digits. This is really crucial since, as you know, you are going to import goods from other countries. There is a, an harmonized system, which is the system which is... Uh, uh, more or less universally accepted to classify the goods under a, a, a specific code. So we have our suppliers, our non EU uh, suppliers, which declare a code which is recognized in 98% of the countries in the world as the harmonized system re re requires. So we have a code of six digits formed by uh, the chapter and the uh, sub items until the six digit. But what happened in the CBAM list, we have the goods identified by the combined nomenclature code, which is composed by eight digit. The uh, combined nomenclature code implement the harmonized system and add the seventh and eighth digit. So we have to 
perform a classification assessment on the code declared by, the, by our non-EU supplier, since obviously they are uh, implementing the harmonized system, but not the tariff nomenclature uh, combined uh, combine classification, which is applied just in EU. So you need to uh, assess the codes declared by your non-EU suppliers in order to understand not solely the customs duties, the VAT and the excise to be applied, but also under the CBAM perspective. Since um, until yesterday, we could say, okay, let's apply the classification co uh, code which provides an higher duty rate to be, to have... Uh, a prudent approach in order to avoid any challenge from the customs authorities but it's now no more possible since we risk to exclude all the um, all the nomenclature combined codes which could be uh, in the perspective of the CBAM regime for example Aurora if I may we, we noticed uh, just recently that uh, if uh, an importer is using for example 8708 uh, which is uh, mainly used for automotive sector. Uh, this is a generic code which hides sometimes some of the 76 chapters. So in this way, this would, uh, uh, would uh, not be precise for the CBAN, it would hide the requirements which are supposed to be fulfilled under the CBAN regulation. So classification, uh, understand it's the core, it's uh, the, the first step in order to understand if a company has uh, to fulfill the CBAM requirements. Yes, for sure, it's the core, but it's not only the uh, the factor to be deemed. So um, just to recap, the combined nomenclature established for the first time in, in 1987 is based on the harmonized system and add the seventh and the eighth digit to the uh, code provided for the harmonized system. But uh, the classification is also uh, the driver in order to understand which is the origin of the goods. When we talk about CBAN goods, we talk about goods listed in the Annex 1, which are originated from third, county, third, third countries, excluded Liechtenstein, Island, Norway and Switzerland, which, and the minor territories which are linked to, let's say, the EFTA countries. And uh, we have to recap which is the concept of origin under EU regulation which is relevant for CBAM purposes. So we have non-preferential origin. This is the second driver for the goods to be uh, in the scope of CBAN, which is the non-preferential origin. Let's say that it's the concept of where the goods is really uh, made in. So we have always a non-preferential origin. We have to understand which is the non-preferential origin in order to be clear for us where the product is made in. And is also the factor in order to apply commercial pol policy, policy measure as the CBAM is. Every product necessarily has a non-preferential origin, which could be different from its preferential origin. What is preferential origin? This is, a, a, let's say, a, provided by a bilateral agreement from country to country, which allow to have a, a um, customs preferential duties or exemption exemption from customs duties, uh, whether some rules are satisfied contained in this, uh, um, in this agreement. Finally, we have understood that we have uh, the non-preferential origin of goods as second driver, but we have to remember that could be um, mainly two cases. In the first cases, it's quite easy to determine which is the non-preferential origin of the goods where this is native. So when we have an apple which is picked up from a Trentino apple, this is certainly made in Italy. Obviously, just one country has contributed to, re to, the, to realize that kind of product. But what happened where two countries or, or more countries are involved in the processing in order to realize that kind of product? Okay, in this case, it's a little bit difficult to understand which is the made in. We have to follow the comp 
the concept of the substantial processing. The substantial processing it means that we, that we have to understand which is the final country in which the goods has received an important phase of the uh, processing. In order to do so, we have the Annex 2201 of the Delegated Act, which helps us all to determine uh, for some goods listed therein, which are the processing which could confer the non-preferential origin of the goods. For the others not included in that annex, we have to study and better understand. So now, just to quickly recap the customs topics, Massimo. Uh, See, yes, Aurora, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, it was exhaustive. And now uh, we can uh, invite uh, Mr. Thomas Brinkman of the DG Taksud uh, to uh, conclude what we have seen so far with all the other panelists. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thomas Brinkham, for uh, as first of all to being with us. Uh, we know you are working hard on the new developments, and uh, the Commission is very busy so far. So thank you for the time you uh, you are dedicating us. Uh, so let me um, let me submit you some questions that we got from. Uh, uh, some of the audience, but also from uh, uh, from the companies with which we are in touch. Uh, first of all, what are the next steps in implementing CBAM after the publication of the regulation? Okay, thank you. First of all, um, uh, Fabio, thanks for the kind introduction and thanks for invi invitation to this webinar and um, welcome to everybody um, listening to this um, to this webinar today so yeah there there will be a lot of things to do in the in the in the transitional uh, uh, period um right now we are still quite busy in in yeah in a number of steps facilitating uh, the transitional period we are the it or the CBA registry has gone online but um it's not fully functioning yet so there are some func uh, functions uh, there so one can access it but um, not all um, all, all uh, features are already included. So there will be uh, soon uh, another update. We are right now performing a number of webinars and, and uh, trainings. They are accessible through our website. If you, we had already four webinars, we have still have um, hydrogen coming and two webinars on steel. Uh, yeah, for everybody who's interested, um, um, please, uh, Put yourself on the list. I'm not sure if that is it's still still possible. Otherwise, the videos will be posted uh, soon. Two videos are already available for cement and aluminium. There's also an interactive uh, training available. Um, we have then in the traditional field a, a raft of implementing and delegated uh, acts to 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 adopt. It will start with with an implementing act on on providing further details on how this um, authorization pr procedure will work to become an authorized declarant in the definitive um, uh, period. Um, and then and the, the commission has been tasked to, to, to do a number of, of assessments and to come up with a, a report uh, before the end of the transitional period, uh, before the end of 2025 regarding um, extension of the of the CBAM and that was already mentioned uh, today uh, several times uh, a potential scope in tank exchange in the future covering more sectors um, indirect emissions for um, not only for the sectors cement um, and fertilizers where is right now but maybe also for steel and aluminium in the future it will look at further upstream products, what we call precursors. It will also look this assessment at further downstream products. Um, so, and the commission, yeah, will come up with with an assessment and potentially with a legal proposal in 2025. Thank you very much. Now, the concern of the company is how to get the information concerning the CO2 from its uh, suppliers. Now, it is allowed the use. Uh, uh, of an average CO2 quantity of emissions in the transitional period, or it is binding for all the companies immediately detect all the information from the non-EU suppliers. Mm. Yes, I think um, mm. Stefan has already um, presented it quite in detail, um, the, the, the possibilities for, for, for using um, um, default values. Yes, it is possible but there are limits. One 
is to use um, default values for the embedded emissions without um, uh, scope limitation. So for the full reporting, that is only possible for the first three quarters. So until July next year, then there's a possibility to use default values if in an installation only a minor contribution to the overall embedded emissions um, uh, occurs. So this is this 20% threshold. This is valid throughout the whole transitional period, but it has a, a quite a limitation. Um, we are particularly thinking here of, um, of installations where the, they get the raw material, let's say an iron or steel, uh, where most of the emissions have occurred with the with the with the with the production of the steel and the and the iron itself, and maybe you know, with a with a with a formation to to steel plates, um, uh, and then the final step is some some printing or some making out of this, which usually is less greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a typical example where then uh, this twenty percent uh, default value could be used. Otherwise. Um, well, the transitional period is a learning period uh, and importers will have to get into contact with, with their suppliers and, and, uh, and at some point get the information and, and use the, the, the CBAM methodology. Until end of 2024, as Stefan has explained, there are also other methodologies that be, could be used, but in 2025, it's basically the CBAM uh, methodology. So by that, uh, by that time, um, importers should have got into contact with the suppliers and 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 ensured that uh, that uh, that the correct methodology is used ultimately it's the importer who is responsible for for the correct reporting well companies notice that the attachment one gave uh, so far a list of certain material we understood from the commission uh, notice that uh, there will be an extension of the scope when we do have we will have some clarity on this extension and which will be the other materials that will be part of the c -bomb. yeah I, I i mentioned it already under the tasks that are, are upcoming in the in the next year i could probably a bit more detail. i mentioned already there are a number of different dimensions to a potential scope extension um for the downstream products the commission has to provide a report by the end of 2024 and for the other aspects, other sectors, um, more indirect emissions, um, precursors, um, the and and potentially inclusion of transport, uh, that was already mentioned also today, that transport so far is not included. That assessment is due by 2025. And um, if appropriate, the Commission will make a proposal. Um, it is likely that there, uh, there, there will be coming a a proposal for extending the scope. I mean, to which extent um, it will it will be there. I mean, there is in particular a reference to the chemical industry and to and to to polymers that was very uh, much um, asked for by the European Parliament. So that's that that will be a particular focus of the assessment. My my this is my personal view. I think it is likely that that an extension will come, but we will have to see. Um, uh, yeah, the extent. Uh, it, it, how big that extension will be and then okay once the proposal is out parliament and council will enter into negotiation and they will have to decide it's then also a question um how much time these negotiations will take place and if a scope extension is agreed from which moment it it would apply um knowing how how that negotiations take time my personal view is at this probably not very likely that the scope extension would apply from 2026. Um, it seems more probable that, that, that it will be a bit later, maybe from 2027 or eight, but it's my, just my personal view. Um, um, well, it's Thank up to, the politicians, to, to politics to decide. It depends on a lot of things. Yeah. Um, let me just, just uh, ask you a final question. I know uh, it's time for you to go, but uh, we are saying that it is a learning period. It will be a learning period for both, for authorities and for companies. Now, since there are sanctions supposed to be applied for a mismatch in the reporting, what is your feeling about that? Would this sanction be applied for sure if an importer will not find the correct information or the learning period will give some flexibility for that? Um. Yeah, I, I said 
we, we, we are in a learning period and, and you're right, it's not just for importers and, and the third country producers will have to get give the data to the importers, but also for, for, the, for the authorities. Um, and the, there are flexibilities uh, included, for example, also for the, for, the, for the first two quarters, while there's a deadline for reporting for the first, I mean, for the, the quarter we are currently in for October, November, December, the deadline is to report is, is end of January, and that is a fixed deadline. So there has to be some reporting, but still importers may modify or correct that report uh, until July. Um, and this, the same applies to this, the first quarter of 2024. Um, so together with the default, default values, uh, this, this uh, possibility to, to correct and modify reports, there is uh, um, quite some flexibility built into, into the transitional period. But on the other hand, yes, if there is, um, is there is infringement of 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 the obligations there is the possibility to 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 apply penalties it will it will follow a certain <clears throat> a certain mechanism the commission will first assess the quality of the of of the data of the reports and if there are incomplete data i mean if there's no data set at all that's also a possibility if there are incomplete data sets uh, and uh, uh, or if there are wrong data sets well then the Commission will um, address these concerns to the member states, and the member states are then the ones who would have to follow follow up. And well, the legislation provides for some penalties, but there is also a range a range given. And of course, if penalties applied, they will certainly depend on the how, how severe um, uh, the the uh, the infringement is. I mean, and the most obvious is not replying or not reporting at all. Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know that uh, the time is over for you, Ben. Thank you for, uh, on behalf of KPMG, for joining this webinar. Uh, we uh, wish you all uh, have uh, all the best to develop uh, this CBAM in the interest of the EU member state. And so uh, have a nice work uh, and uh, we will follow your uh, communications and we will follow the instructions of the Commission for the uh, transitional period, which will uh, put all of us uh, in the new dimension of the relation with uh, the foreign countries. Thank yes, you very thank much for joining thank, this webinar. Thank you again for, for the invitation. And, and thank you also. I see that on your side, you, a, a lot of work has, has, has gone into, into this webinar. And I see very detailed and, and, and very useful presentation slides here. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'll see you soon in another uh, opportunity to meet. Thank okay. you very much. Bye bye. So we, we are going to conclude. Uh, and uh, as you have seen, uh, there are uh, a lot of different uh, perspectives that must be kept into account. It is not a matter of uh, the traditional customs approach because the environmental impact, which was suggested by the Green Deal with the delivery of the CBAN rules, uh, give us uh, different uh, uh, targets to be uh, satisfied. So the uh, understanding of the emission, the identification of the, of the different products, raw materials, which are imported. And what we notice uh, aside of this, that is not only a matter of understanding the right certification code and then to uh, quantify which are the uh, emissions which are related to those materials, but also we need to instruct the supplier in order to uh, provide them what we need to know from them, from the products that we are buying from them. And also, since the information that will be delivered by the supplier will be crucial for the importers in you, it will be better to agree with the suppliers the way of delivering of this information in order to uh, to take them responsible of, of any statement that they will release to any EU importer uh, in order to be safe and not risk to receive information which are not the right one uh, in order to comply with the CIMA rules. As you see, the approach is different, it's in different steps. First, the strategic assessment in order to understand exactly what the, what, which are the materials in the scope, then the calculation of the emissions, 
after that moving with uh, the statement of the accredited verifier and finally meet uh, the requirements of the CBAM compliance and reporting. Uh, I think it is a new perspective of the foreign transaction of the uh, international sale and purchase and we need to know that there is not only a matter of traditional customs competence but we need to uh, to move beyond and to match uh, what is required to follow the uh, green deal uh, perspective of the commission and uh, to put all of them in the new relation that all of us all the companies dealing with customs we have with the custom office from today to the next two years during the transitional period so uh, good luck to you all thank you very much for being uh, with us in this webinar i want to thank all the uh, panelists so ruth Guerra, uh, stefan fresmuth uh, frederick chaper and also thomas brinkman uh, we will keep you posted, we will uh, send you the presentation you see today, and we will try to reply to the different questions we received during this webinar in order to let you know uh, which are the news or to reply to the specific question you just raised. So thank you very much and uh, see you soon in the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.